All right, let's go ahead and get started. Actually, I was uh, worried that the group might be really, really big, which can make things a little difficult for a book club. So I actually am happy to see this size, but if it does get bigger, um, that's fine. And that might happen. We might go up and down throughout the whole or throughout the club. We'll see. Um, so uh, what I'm showing here on my screen is the website I hope to build out as we do this club. I am uh, facilitating this club, club with an ulterior motive of like making something to make clubs easier for future cohorts. Um, and hopefully by the end of it, I can get everyone to the point that you can help me make this. But if not, I will uh, work with you to develop the, the slides. The idea is it's somewhere in between a slide deck and a book. Um, it's online, so I figure that's okay to be this weird kind of hybrid thing. And we've tried it out in a couple other clubs to make these, um, and it's working out pretty well. I know, you know, this is an intro introductory book, so a lot of you probably haven't worked with our markdown, but if you have um, and want to learn to contribute to this, uh, that would be great. Um, so yeah, we're developing this as part of the club. And uh, an important note, Bruno, you've got some background noise. Thank you. <laughs> um, an important note is that there is a um, R4DS community code of conduct. Um, the general idea there is that we are trying to foster an open and welcoming environment. Um, and that we pledge to make participation in our community as a harassment-free experience for everyone, uh, regardless of age, body size, disability, ethnicity, gender identity, expression, level of, of experience, nationality, personal appearance, race, religion, or sexual identity and orientation. The idea is just be nice. Um, I wanted to bring this up formally. Like we don't, ha we, we haven't had problems on our 4DS, which is nice, but just you know, I want to make sure it's a comfortable place and let me know if anything comes up such that it isn't, um, and we will deal with that. All right. So uh, the idea of the club is uh, someone will present a chapter from the book each week. Um, I highly recommend volunteering to do that because, uh, <laughs> number one, it's a great commitment device. Like you will read the chapter if you are the one who's going to be presenting it. Um, but it also makes sure that you really learn it. Uh, the presentations usually will be something like a review of the material that's in there, um, a discussion and or um, a demonstration of something that's happening in the chapter. So if you're doing the chapter that's about importing data, maybe you'll wanna show how to like import Tidy Tuesday data and um, go from there, something like that. Um, we have a GitHub repo for this club and for this book. Um, if you're not familiar with GitHub, I totally understand that because again, this is an introductory book, but I do encourage you to become familiar through the course of the club. Um, it's a very useful tool that a lot of data scientists will end up using at some point. So um, it's useful to learn and this is a good um, like, you know, friendly place to learn. Anywhere that you see this little icon, that's the GitHub icon, uh, the GitHub Octocat. And so if you click that, that'll take you to the repo that goes with this book. Oh, and by the way, if you see me looking over to the right, I have all of your faces, or those of you who are showing faces over on my monitor over here, um, and the chat. So if you want to chat or if you want to just talk, that is also fine. Um, so yeah, there's more info about how to present there, but in for this club, feel free to present however you're comfortable presenting. If you want to make PowerPoint slides, if you want to make a Google slide deck, um, whatever, and then hopefully um, you could share that with me and I'll help you like adapt it into the shared format that we're going to use. But like I said, as we go, it'd be great if we can start to all learn to edit the online book. Um, as the as Zoom told you as you came in, these presentations are recorded, and we put them on the YouTube channel for the community. Um, number one, so that people who miss a week can catch up. Although I haven't been great to at keeping up with the speed of posting, but hopefully I'll get there. Um, also, if you would like to help 
with that, the processing is relatively straightforward, but just takes time because you have to watch the beginning of the video to find where the video actually begins and trim it off. And sometimes that can take a while um, and then upload it and you know tag it and things. There's uh, a, a channel on the Slack book club facilitators that has info about how to help with that. So if you would like to do that, that would be great. Um, this book, oh, I guess, did I say that in here? Yeah, sorry, this this book is at r4ds.io slash book club dash r4ds. Um, so if you ever are looking for this, that's there. And then all these links are available through that. Um, okay, and... All right. So um, before, so I, I do, I, I do plan to kind of go through the introduction. Um, but before that, I would like to go through an introduction of um, each of us. I'm John. I uh, manage the the Slack. Um, my day job is I'm a um, data scientist at Macmillan Learning, and I work with educational content, um, basically trying to make the content better. I do a lot of um, like natural language processing and um, item response theory and things around dealing with questions and answers and student input and things like that. Um, if anyone else would, you know, I'm not gonna force anyone to speak, but it would be nice if you can. So if you'd like to introduce yourself, go ahead and just unmute and go next. Anyone? I can go, I can go next. <laughs> um, yeah. <laughs> Hi, everyone. Um, I'm Susie Nielsen. I am a data reporter at the San Francisco Chronicle, and um, my team uses R for data analysis. And I am fairly new to data as like a discipline. And, a, you know, uh, I, my, yeah, my background is in traditional writing and reporting. And so it's been really fun to learn how to use R, but I definitely um, am looking forward to getting more of a background in data science and um, I'm really excited to be here. Susie, I have a quick question. What is a data reporter? That sounds very interesting. Yeah, it's cool. And a lot of people ask like, are you doing reporting specifically on data sets, like writing about data sets. Mm -hmm. um, basically, we use data sets to tell stories. So data for us is a source like a public official or, uh, you know, a random person. Um, and we use often like public data sets. So I work a lot with, for example, like police department data um, mm -hmm. or, you know, fire, acreage, burnage, burnage. <laughs> um, who knows, that kind of data. Um, and we use it to make compelling visuals and explain to people like stories about the Bay Area, San Francisco. Um, mm -hmm. That's what our team does. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I can send you guys some of our stories if you're interested. Yeah, yeah, I'd definitely be interested. That sounds fantastic. Yeah. Um, I guess I can go next. So um, okay. my name is Sandra Maroy and um, I have a PhD from UC Berkeley uh, in molecular and cell biology. So um, I'm a bench scientist, molecular biologist, um, and I'm very interested in learning how to use R for bioinformatics, uh, like RNA sequencing data and single cell sequencing data. So I have some experience analyzing those data sets, but it's essentially you know packages that already come sort of pre-written and uh, I really want to familiarize myself better with R as many of these uh, data science packages are written in R. And then also like um, working on like high performance clusters uh, to get all of this stuff done and how to integrate, you know, R into, into the cluster. So I, I would consider myself like somewhat of a newbie, like at least in the R language, but I have analyzed those types of data sets. Um, and I'm currently in Lima, Peru, but I've lived in the San Francisco Bay Area for many, many years. So it was nice uh, hearing that Susie is also from there. Excellent. I did want to say um, before we go on that if you are interested in learning more about uh, data journalism, I cannot remember the gentleman's name um, who gave us a talk at our uh, our Studio Global conference in January. Um, from the uh, 
God, I'm I'm not prepped for this, but he did he did a lot of COVID visualization early on in COVID. Does anyone can anyone remember the publication he's with? Does anyone know who I'm talking about? Anyway, he it spoke. might be Andrew Batran. He's like one of the best art it's, data journalists. Um, no, Peter Aldis. Um, <laughs> this is Sorry, just awful. Listing um, anyway, I know. I know. And he's not. I'm not sure that he necessarily. I mean, he does some work in R. Um, man, why can I not? Anyway, um, I don't want to take up the whole talk trying to remember this, but he was one of the keynotes because you know, obviously that was that is something that everyone was interested in at um, in recent times. Um, and Morgan knows what talk I'm talking about. Um, <laughs> uh, I don't know any of the details either. <laughs> but it was, so if you go to, um, just Google our studio global, um, they have all of the videos and the resources section. And I'm trying to see John, yeah, John Byrne Murdoch um, is the talk and he's right there at the, up at the top. There we go. <laughs> okay. Um, Morgan, do you want to introduce yourself or are your kids climbing too much? Yeah, oh, they, they are. So you're going to hear a toddler in the background. <laughs> so, uh, I'm Morgan Grovenberg. Uh, I'm a, I'm the retention specialist at Northeastern State University in Oklahoma. And, um, essentially what I do is I turn data into action for the benefit of our students. So I work with student data. Um, and I, right now, I use R to wrangle and visualize. Um, but what I'm really interested in is learning how to use models in R. That's, that's my goal. John, if you'd like, I can go next. Everyone, I'm uh, Ryan. I uh, live in Lincoln, Nebraska. I'm a uh, UNL grad student, uh, 2017, uh, four years, five years out. Uh, grad student, uh, I work in the transportation network. Uh, so those, uh, Susie and uh, uh, Sandra, uh, you being in the, uh, the Bay Area um, last year, 2019, I was doing all the uh, training for Caltrain, uh, the uh, new positive train control system that they're deploying. Um, I represent the, the, uh, our company with, with integrating positive train control across the entire US. So if uh, anybody is interested in railroading, I'd be more than happy to, to give you some feedback on that. Um, at any rate, uh, the application, this, this PTC system that the uh, United States is deploying, um, it's, it's very, it's got an undertone that nobody really realizes yet. And it's very data driven. So as a technical trainer, as an educator, and then also as a, a, a blooming data science, uh, uh, at least I'm trying to get into that field, uh, processing a lot of that material and, and giving some worthwhile thoughts into um, track beds, uh, uh, locomotive consist data, uh, logistics, et cetera. Uh, so, that's I'm, I'm looking forward to, to uh, interacting with all of you uh, in the coming future, as well as a couple of the other book clubs as well. So, thank you. That sounds awesome, Ryan. Thank you for sharing. Yeah, yeah, that sounds great. And I'm sorry I was muted when I was trying to say yes. Go ahead. Um, all right. Anyone else? Like I say, you're free not to introduce yourself, but the more you get involved, the the more you're gonna get out of this club. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> yeah, hi, I'd like to introduce myself. Um, um, my name is Eileen Murphy and my background is in uh, relational database uh, design and development. And, um, and I went into journalism and publishing for, for a few number of years. And then I'm winding back now to, um, I guess, uh, data analytics. And so I entered into Ryerson's uh, certification program for data analytics, and I'm hoping to go for my master's um, there as well. So um, I guess in the fall, I'll be studying. Uh, I've taken R there, and in the fall, I'll be taking Python. So 
that's where I am. <laughs> and uh, I, I, I actually, I actually like the whole, um, uh, the whole, you know, getting stories out of data. And I'm really uh, fascinated by the data journalism aspect as well. So, yeah, I'm really, uh, I'm enjoying meeting all of you. Eileen, <laughs> I mean, it's nice to see you again. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> Right. Anyone else? Um, my name is Wai Yin. I'm a software developer. Um, so I know like um, mostly on the web, but so it's JavaScript, Ruby, Python, a little bit of PHP. And I'm just beginning to learn R just to do, like I can do some basic analysis, clean up using Python. So now I want to learn R to do that too. Um, so I, I think I went through the intro R book, but I haven't gone through this um, R book. So learning to do that. Okay. okay. Anyone else? Okay. Hey, oh, sorry. Um... Oh. <laughs> Okay, let me go. Um, okay. Hey, everyone. Can you hear me? Yes. Can you hear us? I, yes, I can hear you. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, sorry. My internet is quite bad. I'm um, oh. losing jockey. Uh, yeah, uh, I'm currently doing my master's at Hasselt University in statistics and data science, but specializing in biostatistics. Yeah, I've, I've learned R from my undergraduate till now, but I have also gone through this book, the r for ds textbook, but uh, I'm looking forward to the discussion. I'm from Kenya, Nairobi, Kenya. Yeah, thank you so much, John, for facilitating this. Thank you. Very glad to have you. Um, I talked, um, a while back at a um, online for a group in, I think it was in Kenya. Um, and that was very, you know, it's it's great how the world is getting smaller through the internet and through talks, you know, groups like this. So I, I like that a lot. All right. Uh, Federica, it looked like you were trying to talk. <laughs> Hello. Hello. Hello, um, my name is Federica. Uh, I'm from Italy. Um, I like to introduce myself, saying that um, uh, I'm really glad to be part of this uh, book club because I'm, I think it's very important to uh, be sharing uh, um, learning step by step. Uh, and it, it's very interesting to um, exchange uh, information and so all the things that we learn step by step. I have a degree, bachelor degree in statistics and actuarial science. I am an actuary, fully qualified um, at La Sapienza University in Rome. And um, I'm an affiliate of the Institute and Faculty of Actuaries and a collaborator with the HME. Um, so I look forward to be a bit more practical using R. Uh, and I'm strongly interested in uh, uh, developing modeling um, for, I don't know, looking forward for some interesting answers. Um, which I'm uh, curious to to find. So thank you very much for this uh, book club, and uh, so uh, hopefully to enjoy it to the end. Thank you. Thank you for joining. I know you've done um, one or two other clubs, I think. Um, so it's glad to, you know. I like to see people right. doing lots of clubs on on the site. It's great. Yes, I'm, I'm part of the Mastering Shiny book club and the modeling is just I've taken part to a couple of uh, sessions, but uh, I'm, I'm still um, 
So I should, um, I'm still deciding if to, to start back with the new court or um, I don't know. Let, um, the, the, this one is just starting now. So I've get, taken the, the chance for, for doing this court from the beginning. That makes sense. <laughs> All right. Anyone else? Bruno or Lucas? Luke, you? I'm not sure I'm seeing your name right. I'll go next. Okay. It's Lucas, actually. Okay. <laughs> right. my, my name is Lucas Vasera. I am a, a data analyst at a cancer research center um, here in Florida. I am new to R, but I have done programming in other programming languages like, like SAS and, and Java and, and other ones. So I'm, I'm looking forward to, to learning R. Hey, Bruno. Hey, everyone. Not sure if there are a lot of noise here. <laughs> I'm from Brazil. Uh, I'm a statistics student and work as a DBA here. I started the book, the cohort four, but it was a bit late for me in Brazil. So it was hard to start at, at late at night. So and this one has just started a better <laughs> time. So I'm really happy to be part of this one. Yeah. Thank you, John. Thank you, everyone. All right. Great. I'm glad to, to meet all of you. Um, like I say, you know, it's on screen here. Uh, a volunteer or volunteering to present a chapter is the best way to learn this material by far because it forces you to feel comfortable enough with it to talk about it. So I do highly recommend everyone do that. Um, I am going to set up a Google form um, or I'm going to set up some, some other clubs have done things different ways. I'm going to get that set up this afternoon. I'm not sure exactly how, and I'll post about it on the Slack um, for everyone to sign out chapters. Um, first come, first serve kind of thing. And um, you don't have to sign up right away. But if you see something in the table of contents that sounds particularly interesting to you, um, grabbing it before someone else does could be a good idea. Um, and for next week, we will be doing chapter two. So be thinking about if anyone wants to volunteer for that one. Um, it would be great. I do actually already have um, like learning objectives written and actually some, I think we have slides for chapter two. So you, all you have to do is use what's here and then maybe adapt it or you can do your own, whichever way you want to do it. All right. So let's, without further ado, um, the, the intro for this book I was doing, so I, I ran, um, <laughs> I began this club with a group at work and then uh, other projects came in and club kind of fizzled out so that's what this book was started as is i did it at, at work um i work in education and therefore i write learning objectives for all the chapters which um i've been told is helpful to have so uh i was i was gonna skip this thing it's just the preface it's like oh this is how this book works we don't need to do this as part of the club and then you start reading it and this is actually a super useful introduction um it goes over what does a data science project look like. That's useful info to have. Um, it, it gives the reasoning for the way that the book is laid out, which is um, useful. Um, they We will learn to recognize topics that aren't explicitly covered and kind of why they talk about why that some things aren't covered. Some of that can be useful because if you might, you know, if you're expecting to learn about big data, this doesn't go into big data. It'll help you work with big data, but it doesn't talk about um, with, you know, how to work with big data and how to, there are some special things to worry about when you have a giant data set. Um, it will tell, tell us how to set up an environment, which is useful. So if you don't currently have uh, our studio all set up to go, we'll be going through that. Um, we'll talk a little bit how that, you know, the book is a static thing. Um, and it's online, so it's not exactly the same as what your console is going to look like as you're entering code. So they, they explain that. And they go into how to get help. And that's super useful to know. Like um, one of my favorite R courses, um, I've 
worked with, he had a question that was intentionally, he was like, okay, and now I want you to Google how to do this thing that I didn't teach you because that's how you really work when you're working in R. And so the question was, how do you do this thing? And go just go find it on the internet. I'm not gonna tell you. Um, and it's useful to know that like no one knows everything about how to do things in R. So learning how to look up how to do it is a really useful part of learning. All right. Um, so this figure uh, is it, like, this is the figure that kind of defines this book. Everyone brings up this figure when they're talking about this book. This is the data science workflow. Um, and in fact, uh, other books will like build onto this book. It's like, hey, we're doing a book about this section of the R4DS workflow, or we're doing a book about this section. So the general idea is you import data, you tidy it, you clean it up, make it usable. You do some transformations on it and you visualize it and you model it. And, and sorry, this is um, specifically like the exploratory data analysis workflow. And we'll go into what the difference is there. But anyway, so you do all this expl exploration in it to understand what you're, what's happening, and then you communicate. Um, an important definition here, it's kind of what um, Hadley Wickham, who is the lead, you know, one of the two authors on this book, um, what he's known for is tidy data. Um, the idea of tidy data is you want each column in your data to be one variable and each row is one observation. And that sounds super simple, but when you work with real data, um, you will, when you start thinking in those terms, you realize, oh no, like, you know, one observation is spread over three rows, or this row is actually a con concatenated three different observations that really should be their own rows. And so, um, you know, we'll get into the details of that later, but understanding that concept can make your life easier and also calling it out as a separate step of get your data in a clean format and then do everything else because. Um, once it's in a clean format, it's easier to understand, easier to work with. Um, transforming, that's like looking, filtering out, you know, maybe you only want to work, look at data before March of 2020, when all data became meaningless. Uh, if you're trying to look at historical trends, because, you know, everything changed. Um, for example, so you might want to only look at things before or after that. You might want to mutate existing columns to uh, get new columns. So, uh, instead of date, you want, might want day of the week. That would be a transformation. And then you might summarize data. We'll talk about how that works. Um, visualization is a super important part of data exploration. It's a way to kind of quick, quickly summarize for yourself and for other people, what does this data say? Um, it's not uh, automatable usually. I don't remember exactly why I pulled that note out when I wrote this, but uh, you know, it's something that you want to you want to do when you're really digging into the data. Uh, we have the Tidy Tuesday project as a thing that R4DS runs, where every week uh, Thomas Mock posts a new free public data set that you can play with, and people on Twitter with uh, hashtag Tidy Tuesday make visualizations of that data. Um, I will very likely be pulling examples in from that because there are like thousands of them out there on the internet. Um, and that's a very, that's a good way to kind of uh, challenge yourself. Um, Jesse Mustpack, who actually started this group, the R4DS online learning community is doing a thing now where she does like the beginning of a Tidy Tuesday visualization each week and kind of, and gives everyone, here's the code and walks people through how she does it. And then it gives you a starting point. So if you're new, that's following her um, can be very useful to find that kind of thing. She works at our studio now as a um, like developer advocate, but she does a lot of public work like that. All right, so another thing that we'll be talking at least a little bit about is modeling. Um, once you know what you're asking, trying to um, make something that can like predict future outcomes, for example. Um, that's very useful. Trying to turn to like put the data into terms of like logical relationships is basically what modeling is about. And then at the end of this is communicate. Um, that's a critical part of data science is 
uh, you know, once you figure something out, you need people to know about it. Um, and so they, they go into a lot about how to, uh, how to communicate your data using R. There are a lot of great tools in R to build um, both visualizations, but entire documents. And then it's not shown in the graph, but I guess, I mean, it's in, in the figure as like wrapping the whole thing of programming um, is a way to uh, unlock things that it wouldn't be possible to do by hand. And so this book goes into programming to a degree. Um, if you get very interested in that part, that aspect of the book, there is the book Advanced R, which goes into more of the programming side of R. And uh, we have several book club cohorts for that as well. All right. So first, let's look, or so next, let's look at the way that the book is laid out. Um, so if we look at the figure, you know, it starts with import and tidy, but those are like, the generally uh, acknowledged boring parts of the whole process. And so they start with visualization and transformation and just let's pretend you already have the data. Um, I actually, I really like that because after the first real chapter, now counting this one, you're able to like make pretty nice looking visualizations right away. Um, it, so it shows you what, what you'll be able to do once you can do all the steps. After that, we'll go back to importing and tidying because that's necessary. Um, and it's not as bad as some people make it out to be. And then after that, we'll start programming. Um, that lets us simplify some of the other steps and just and you know make the repetitive stuff easier. And then I say here that we might go into modeling and communicating because there are books that have come out since this book that focus on those areas. And we'll see what the club wants to do once we get to that point, whether we wanna do the version that's in this book or we wanna branch into other books or what we wanna do. Um, all right, any any questions or thoughts so far about what we're doing? I don't wanna mon monopolize, but I also, you know, we can just go through. <laughs> all right. So it, uh, importantly, some things that aren't covered in this book, like I mentioned, big data. Um, what that means is very vague. Um, but in general, like if you're working with uh, something that's like billions of rows of data, you need other tools to, to be able to work with it. Like your computer will blow up if you try to just um, dive in, basically. Well, it won't actually blow up, but it will run out of RAM. Um, so he doesn't go into how to do that in this book. Um, honestly, most of the time you end up just working with a subset of that data, at least in my experience anyway. And so once you have a subset, all the rules apply that are taught in this book. Um, I have now, a question. Yeah. When you say big data, how big are you talking? <laughs> it is a very vague term because it depends on like, I think of big data as data that won't fit in your RAM. And so I, like my laptop has 64 gigs of RAM. So big data is much bigger for me than for someone who has eight gigs of RAM. Um, but it also like, it's just, it, it, so it's, uh, you know, obviously that's super, super vague. Um, if you have, like, some people will say, you know, like a million rows. Oh, this table, this table has a million rows in it, and then that's big. But I work with millions of rows of table or of data, often, so that doesn't seem as big to me. So that's why I say it's a very vague term. Um, it used to be something that a term that was used more, and then I think people started to realize that no one knew what you were talking about when you said big data. Um, and so it's gone away a little bit. Like, I think some of the tidy Tuesday, Tuesday data sets probably would count as big data to some people, but they're just something you can easy, relatively easily download the entire data set off the internet. So it's not really big data. Like, you know, all of Twitter would be big data. Some subsets of, of Twitter would be big data, but if you scrape some little, some, some subset of that, it's no longer big data. Um, so, uh, yeah, <laughs> it's, it's a good question, and I'm sorry that there isn't really an answer. But uh, the things that he doesn't go into are, 
the types of big data where it doesn't fit in your RAM. And so you need special tools where you're working with it on disk and doing like writes in between processing or processing subsections of the data before loading it in. He, the book doesn't go into all of those tools. Um, yeah. Did that kind of answer it at least? <laughs> All right. So um, we're not going to talk about Python, Julia, any other um, data analysis tools. We're, this is specifically about R. Um, I kind of, I, I am, uh, Hadley, who wrote the book, is a big advocate of, you know, really master one tool before you decide to work with other tools. There's some benefit to getting like the shallow understanding of Python and R because you kind of start to see the similarities and differences. So that's a different philosophy. This book is written in the philosophy of let's learn all about R first, and then we'll go on to other tools, maybe if we need to. Um, this does this book doesn't go into uh, what's known as non-rectangular data. Um, if you hear about like graph networks or um, just network data, network graphs, uh, that's kind of the other kind of data that this book doesn't really go into. I don't think there's even a like well-established R book on network graphs yet, but there is a tidy graph package written by one of the members of the Tidyverse team, which we'll talk about what that means a lot throughout this book. Um, that does go into that kind of data. It's, general, it's like working with data that is in rows and columns is the easiest way to use R, and so this book focuses on that. Um, that tidy graph package is actually made to turn network graphs into uh, rows and column data because then it's easier to work with. So this book doesn't go into it, but it's uh, not that far off from this book. And then this book doesn't go into um, the hypothesis confirmation side of data science. It's purely the exploratory data analysis. Um, we have a few other like stats book clubs that go into more of the like hypothesis confirmation kind of work um so it, you know if that's something that you want to do i it in all these cases these things that aren't covered having this book first is still useful in order to do these other things Maybe, you know, you might want to start with Python or Julia <laughs> separate from this book, but uh, working with non-rectangular data, well, knowing how to work with rectangular data knows, lets you, like a lot of the tools for working with the non-rectangular stuff tell you how it's different from rectangular data. They start from the idea that you already know how to do um, filter and mutate and things that we're going to learn in this book. So it's useful to lear learn everything that's in this book first in any of these cases, in my opinion. All right, so another thing that's gone, that he goes over in the book that, you know, definitely do this if you have not already, is how to set up your environment to work with R. Um, you want R and RStudio, oh, and one way to do this is if you go to rstudio.cloud, I'm not sure what the what's free on there anymore, but they have, online versions of RStudio that you can work with. And usually for education, it's free. I don't know how what qualifies as for education, but um, so there's that, but you can also just, you know, R and RStudio are free and open and you can install them on your own machine. So if you have one to work with that can, you know, that works. Um, so they tell you how to install those. If anyone needs help with that, ping me on the Slack and we'll walk through it. Um, you also need the tidyverse. So the tidyverse is a group of packages that this book, this book was written to work with those packages and those packages were written to make this book, uh, easier to use. So, um, they're, they're really like friendly, helpful packages. And then three more packages, which are basically data, um, that they use as examples in the book. All right question yep uh, okay for new new people do you know the difference between our language and our ide which is our studio because i know some people get yes. those confused because it's talked about the same yes yes and do you know the difference between 
you'll hear this term base R versus <laughs> high D versus R. Yes. Okay. Those are great questions. So let's start with so R. You know, R is the language. Um, when you install R, it has a console, a simple console where you can type and it'll show you the results. So you can work with R just by installing R. That's enough. R Studio is a um, a company and the product of that company, which is an IDE, which means Integrated Developer and in Development Environment, um, where it has that R console, but then it also has like built-in help window and it has. Um, separate windows for files that you're working with within R, um, all those kinds of tools, and then other built-in um, just helper tools. So you don't need R Studio to work in R, but it makes it makes your life much easier. Um, and to work with this book, you kind of do need R Studio. Um, I mean, technically, you could, but I, I highly, 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 highly recommend R Studio. It's free for uh, most purposes. So use our studio. Um, so that's R versus our studio. Did that make sense? You have any questions about that? Okay. Then base R means just when you download R, when you install R, it comes with base R and then there are two or three other packages that come with it that are considered part of base R, the utils package, uh, mass, uh, stats and um, and then the graphic something the basic base graphics packages those are just like the core they're the the packages that are written by um, the R consortium like the, the the core R team and then part of R is the ability this this function install packages that anybody can write a package for R um, and so the tidyverse is a family of packages written by a team who is not part of core r uh, that the intent of tidy the tidyverse is to make it easier to read the code and easier to write the code um, there is a big philosophical difference between should you learn base r first should you learn the tidyverse first i like the tidyverse is written for humans base r is written for machines um it's we are humans it's more efficient for us to be able to read the code who cares if like the, the computer will be able to read the code uh eventually um but we need to write that code first and so working in the tidyverse the whole idea is to make it really easy to remember how to do things really easy to discover how to do things and you don't have to get all the you know remember whether you want one bracket or two for each step that you're doing and all these different things so um, that is the difference, that the, the tidyverse is a, a set of packages on top of base R. Did that, did that answer the question? Yep, just want to make that clear because there are <laughs> other, other tutorials that just teach base R. So if you go somewhere else and, yes. do, and then you go, why does it look so different? <laughs> That's why. Yeah, um, like eventually it is good to be able to read code that is purely in base R and in for some like at, at this point sometimes I try to write things in base R if I don't want to have to use some specific package because those packages take up memory and if you're doing some of the bigger stuff um, you might not want to take up any any RAM because you need all of the available RAM things like that for 99% of cases using the tidyverse is what you want to do it's easier it's fast or it's well sometimes it's faster usually it's not faster but it's faster for the human it's faster to write faster to easier to read um all right so uh they have a section on running our code and just it goes over that the code in the book um looks slightly different than it will in your console in our studio and don't freak out about that um i recommend looking at the book for the exact differences but it's uh it, you, like they put um, hashtag like quote characters in front of the results. The the hash character in R mean is a comment character, so it means it doesn't count as code. Um, they've got some of those in the book in places. Um, 
just reading through the differences, just, just knowing that when you type a thing, it will get the same result, but it might not look exactly the same. That's all that's about. All I right. Oh, quick quick yep. question. Go ahead. Um, so someone asked about the, the difference between Bazaar and, and Tidyverse. Uh, th there's another version of R programming that I've come across. Data dot table, data table, they call it. Yeah. All right. So there's a kind of a third universe. So there's the base R, you know, universe. That's just everything's built on top of base R. The tidyverse is a set of packages developed for readability. And then uh, data dot dot table, data table is a really one package, but then there are some packages that are written to go with it that are built for speed. And if you are working with big data or like time of code execution really matters, it is good to eventually learn data table. Um, personally, like I, I still, even when I'm working with big things, I tend to work in the tidyverse because it's easier for me to read and write the code. And if it takes an extra 20 minutes to execute, that's okay. Sometimes I need coffee. So, um, you know, it, there's, it depends what you're doing. If you're doing a lot of like production work um, that you need the code to run fast and often, data table can be useful. If you're working with really big data, data table can be useful. But the, and apparently once you've worked with it a lot, the syntax makes sense. But the syntax is very um, like efficiency driven, not readability driven. I and I think that would be kind of the, the big divide between the tidyverse and data tables. Data table is super efficient. Um, it's fast to type once you know what you're doing, and it's really fast to run, but it's incomprehensible if you don't really, if you haven't really gotten into it. Versus the tidyverse, once you learn a couple of things, the whole idea of tidyverse code is you can read it like a sentence. Like when you're going through it, you just read it. If you read it out loud, it has a meaning. It's really like once you learn a couple of little tricks, um, it's just it it's readable, and that's the whole goal. Is they want you, they want a human to understand it. Does that make sense? Yeah. So I always struggle with this question. Um, would you recommend just I don't know learning tidyverse R alone, and you can you so can I would get away with <laughs> this R without without knowing anything. I would recommend learning the tidyverse first. Um, because it, it is built for learnability. And then once you know the tidyverse, learning how to do some things in base R without the tidyverse can be useful. Learning how to do it in data table for efficiency can be useful if you had, like, again, you know, let's say you have something that has to be able to run um, within seconds of some other event happening. Well, data table might help you reach that goal. I, I don't have that experience. I don't, I haven't, I still haven't really learned data table. I've worked with it a couple of times and there are probably some things that I have that would be better in data table, it'd be faster, whatever, but it, that hasn't been the gate for me. Like it, I haven't had to have anything um, instantaneously. Like on that note, I actually have some uh, code running right now on my laptop and hopefully it's not causing any noise or problems or anything that, um, it will be running for the next two, two days, probably, but it's just running in the background. Um, if it were in data table, it'd probably only be running for the next day instead of the two days, whatever, but close enough. Um, if, and you know, when it's going to take a long time, I don't really care. You know, a long time is a vague idea that a couple of days and one day, not that different. And if, if it, could change from a couple of days to 15 minutes, maybe that'd be important. Um, but even then, if it would take me a couple of days to write the code, then I didn't really save anything other than my computer not having to work. Um, so yeah. <laughs> All right, thank you for that. You're welcome. All right. Um, so the, the last section of this chapter is about getting help. Um, there are lots of tips in here, and I, I can't remember which parts of these are from the book and which parts are things I've joined or I've added. Uh, but the first thing, um, 
Jenny Bryan had a whole talk about this. She's one of the R Studio um, Tidyverse team members. Um, she had a talk at R Studio Conf uh, 2019, I think. About part of it was about like learning to actually read error messages, and she acknowledged that um, a lot of times when you see an error, all you see is there's an error. Like it's hard to it, you just see this red angry text, but uh, tidyverse error messages are written to actually be helpful. Like sometimes it'll say the, you know, whatever, that this thing didn't make sense. Did you mean to use equals equals instead of equals? Things like that. And having that in the error message, like that, I bring that one up because that happens all the time. That is, we'll get into that when you're filtering, you want equals equals, and it's easy to accidentally just type equals. And it tells you, hey, that's probably what you did. Um, so it's basically telling you, just fix this thing in your code and your code will work great. Um, another thing is the ex exact text, text of the error message probably appears in some comment somewhere on the internet if it's a, you know, like that error exists for a reason. And if you can't make sense of what the error is telling you, if you just copy and paste that into Google, um, maybe removing any proprietary information <laughs> or private information, that kind of thing, but just copy paste most of the error message. Uh, usually that'll take you to actually stackoverflow.com, um, which is a website of questions and answers. Um, so just copy paste it into Google. Often you can find help. One of the places that you find help is Stack Overflow, which they mention in the book. Um, I put this little note in here of beware, like it can be very toxic on Stack Overflow, um, very sexist a lot of times. So just be aware of that, that website, like they actually have done some efforts to try to clean up some of the toxic, even so some of it, it isn't even um, blatant toxicity, but it's more like uh, someone's answer will just be, this has been answered before. It's like, okay, thanks, but I didn't find the answer. so. Could you maybe help? Um, and so just be aware that when people are mean or kind of rude on Stack Overflow, that sucks, but that's how it works. But Stack Overflow is a great archive of answers. So if you have a question and you search and one of the links is Stack Overflow, usually you can go over there and it'll like walk you through exactly how it was answered. People flag which answer is correct, you know, which answer actually helped them. And so you just have to look for that green check mark and then you know, okay. This this actually solves this question problem. Um, another place that all of you know about is R4DS. Um, if you come to our Slack, uh, we work to be the opposite of Stack Overflow in that way. That um, if someone just answers with, uh, you know, you should know how to do this, or why didn't you just Google it? I tend to delete those answers, um, and they don't come up that often. So uh, just you know, generally, if you ask on Slack, people will answer. Um, fairly nicely. Not always instantaneously, but we actually have a dashboard for the mentors to um, try to make sure any every question gets answered. Um, if your question hasn't been answered in, I think it's currently, three, or if there hasn't been a comment on it in three weeks, it'll fall off of the dashboard. Um, so if you, st if you really need help, just replying to your thread with, hey, does anyone have any ideas with the, for this? Um, we'll bring it back up. Um, they talk a little bit in the book about what is called a reprex. There's a whole package around this, and the idea is a reproducible example. Um, when you make a reprex, you want to say what packages you use. So we'll talk about packages soon. Um, like if you use dplyr, you want to put in your reprex library dplyr. Uh, you want to provide the like as small of a data set as you can that can be used to reproduce your problem. You know, maybe you're saying, well, when I load this um, giant CSV um, and then do all these other things, it fails. Well, if someone's trying to help you, it helps to have that data. So even if you can share the CSV, if you can include a little um, piece, that dput function, um, I think it's data put is probably what it stands for. It, and it takes whatever you put into it and shows you how to reproduce it in another system. So if you have a variable 
um, that has, you know, a list of a thousand numbers, when you put D put, it'll create, it'll give you the code that you need to produce that variable in another um, system. And so that's really useful when you're sharing with someone else that they can start from where you're starting, run your code, see what happens. Maybe they have familiarity with that error or that kind of thing. Um, and then the other thing in, re in Reprex is um, go through and make your code easy to read, maybe change variable names from you called it var1, but you want to actually call it what it is. And like, I didn't put this in here, but the useful thing about writing a Reprex is usually when you, you're like, you check what packages you need. Oh, whoops, I forgot to actually library that package. That's why my code didn't work. You check what data you need need and oh this data actually uh has a missing value here that's why it didn't work you make your code easy to read you find that you're missing a comma or a parentheses or something so the secret behind making a reprex is nine times out of ten it'll solve the problem because you'll realize what you did wrong and then that tenth time you come to r4ds and you have this nice clean reprex that you can share um and it helps people like if i can't run the code usually i can't figure out what what's wrong like if you give the error message maybe i can help tell you what it means but i can't confirm that is you know that my answer is correct whereas if you make a proper reprex i can just make the little tweak run it and it'll work so or or it won't work and i'll know that i didn't actually answer the question um one other piece of place to get help that i don't think they mentioned in the book but the our stats hashtag on twitter is um, very active and, you know, considering it's Twitter, it's kind of amazing because it's like friendly and uh, helpful and um, just, I don't know, it, that's, it's a strange place for Twitter. So uh, I had a Twitter account and then I didn't use for Twitter or use Twitter for a long time. And then I got into uh, data science and someone told me, hey, this RStats hashtag, go check it out. And it is, it's a great way to uh, meet people. That's how you know. That's where I found out about the R4DS community, which now I run. Um, that's so basically this book club, book club exists because of our stats Twitter, um, and th there are lots of friendly people. You learn a lot. Uh, there are lots of you know, like all of the new packages or updates to the Tidyverse packages, things like that get announced on Twitter. Um, so if you can. Uh, I recommend getting into our stats Twitter or just searching, like, you know, if you click on this hashtag, just go to Twitter and type hashtag our stats. Um, obviously that's because hashtag R is way too vague and R was designed for uh, statistics. So our stats became the standard uh, hashtag for R on Twitter. And once you find that, you'll find lots of things. Now, don't get me wrong. It is still Twitter. I'm sure there are unfriendly people and unfriendly things even in the RStats hashtag, but eventually as you use Twitter, it learns like what you interact with. And my my feed is mostly uh, friendly and beautiful. So uh, I recommend that. And I think, yeah, that's the end. So that's the intro. And like I said, you know, this is the, this isn't even chapter one in the print version of the book. It's, you know, before the, the preface before chapter one, but lots of useful info in there. Um, does anyone have any questions, thoughts, ideas? I have one thought. <laughs> okay. When when you when you have when you have to you have a question, you look it up online. Look at the date of the reply. If it's a <laughs> yes. blog post, look at the date. If it's on Stack Overflow, there might be like twenty different answers. Don't just look at the top answer. Look through the list and see some of the newer answers because as the language changes. And as a package gets updated, some commands that mm -hmm. used to exist might no longer exist, or some commands that uh, worked in three years ago, they actually improved it. So now instead of writing like three mm -hmm. lines of code, you can write just one command. Yep. So that's why um, looking at dates when you're looking for help for both error messages and um, code help is useful. Very good point. Um... Yeah, the it, it, you know, programming languages evolve fast, and so if the answer is from 2012, like yeah, technically it might, it probably still works because R tries to be everything tries to be backwards compatible, but it's probably not the best way to do it. Um, 
so that is definitely something to keep in mind. That's a great point. I have a quick question. So when we, um, you know, write our presentations, are we aiming for about an hour's worth of material or? Yes. And, um, you know, we're a little bit over now, but, you know, this was uh, the first one. I'm not, uh, like, I don't practice these. I just kind of write them and summarize them and go through. And so if we end up, um, if you end up doing a summary and, you know, we, we're halfway through the chapter and it's been an hour, um, generally we will try to end at that point and pick it up the next week. I don't okay. know if that will happen. Um, these ones we actually, you know, I've, I've done meetings of the first few chapters mm -hmm. and they have worked out to be, I think pretty close to exactly an hour each time we did them. So um, with discussion like these, I think that they wrote them towards college classes. And so the chapter tends to be about of an hour of material. Like, okay. I think it's That's designed perfect. that way. Yeah. <laughs> um, it's been actually kind of amazing that each of these book clubs, I don't practice any any of these. Like, I, I don't do these like it's a conference talk or anything. And it usually works out to be, you know, like, okay, I'm a little over, but we started five minutes late. Um, so I think a chapter tends to be about an hour of information in almost <laughs> every case. Now, we actually right. we're doing this book in a different club. Um, it has, uh, I think, seven chapters across, you know, a whole book. That one we tend to go over like we're doing more than more than one week per chapter because the chapters are gigantic. Um, mm -hmm. But most books that I've done tend to be about an hour a chapter. Okay. Sounds um, good. Is that the uh, practical statistics? Yes. Okay. Is a cohort starting for that anytime soon or where are you guys at? So we are, we're getting, we're a little over halfway through and oh, okay. we'll, we'll probably do another cohort at some point. Although like we're, we have a few different stats books uh, clubs mm -hmm. running right now. And I might lean towards one or the other once we see how they go. And I don't know which ones, if, if we'll redo all of them, but if there's interest. Uh, we'll do a club. I see. <laughs> okay. Um. All right, so next week, uh, we will do chapter two, which is um, actually, if I'm remembering right, we probably want to do chapter two and chapter three. Let me, um, so chapter two, yes, this is chapter two. We are looking at chapter two right now. So let's do chapter two and chapter three. So the online version of the book, every section of the book gets a number. And so this thing that's called chapter two is really the introduction to this whole section of the book. And it's a it's a one page introduction. Um, so I recommend, strongly recommend we do two and three. Three is on data visualization. It's a fun chapter. Um, so given that, oops. Oh, okay. um, so yeah, this is my notes on chapter two and then we go into three. So it's a one slide chapter two. Um, again, chapter three, we have notes for if, you know, if nothing else, um, chapter two and three, sorry. So if nothing else, I will just walk through the slides that already exist, but I highly recommend someone else prep and read it and do it because again, that's the best way to learn. Um, so does anyone want to volunteer? I'm catching up on the, the chat. Um, yeah. Okay, um, I will do that. All right. Great, Federica. So chapters two and three, again, chapter two is just, basically it's this graphic and saying we're gonna focus here. Um, so. Okay, there's just to, to make some uh, notes on the, um, as well as you did it. And then, um, in introducing some how to do to make a graph using ggplot2 yes exactly um oops so i do want to copy this into the chat oops so that is the, this book that um i've been using so if you look it's laid out like a book um a lot of these later chapters 
are just that's the entirety of the chapter right now. But I think um, I'm trying to remember where we got. So yeah, through chapter four, I already have all the visualization or all the notes, and then after that, we'll be developing them as we go. Um, we do have learning objectives for some of the other chapters, and I'm going to try to pre-fill these um, before we get to them. Because the idea is, you know, those kind of give you a little guide of try to have a slide for learning objective, maybe a couple slides, gives you an idea of what we're going to be looking at. Um, the R for data science link that you just copied and pasted into the chat isn't working for me. I was oh. wondering if anyone else is getting an error message. I wonder. If, it's, it's, it's broken. Yeah. Okay, it's one second. Uh, oops. I'll bet you it is just this and that I wrote it wrong in there. Yep. So let's try okay. that again. Thank you. Um, and so let me show you. Let's do this live. If we go to, yeah, there's an edit button on each page. And so, for example, I can just come in here and edit it. And oops, let's edit it there as well. And uh, fixed book link. You would say create a new branch for this commit and start a pull request. I don't think you'll have the option to commit directly to the main branch. Um, I really shouldn't ever do this, but I want to get it in there real quick. So I'm going to do that. And now in a minute after it finishes rebuilding, that link will be fixed in the book. So don't be afraid to, uh, if you see a problem, this is a great way to kind of get started learning how GitHub works. You know, you need to create an account and all that for this to work, but you can just click that edit button and, or, you know, within the book, click the edit button and it lets you kind of uh, have a, a low, um, low stress way to learn to use GitHub which again, I think is a really useful skill to have. Let's see if it's, no, it's not quite updated yet. Make sure that the, yeah, it's, it's running the process to rebuild the book. Um, but yeah, if you see typos, please uh, just, I mean, you can just let me know, but I highly encourage you to just click the edit button and try to fix the typo if you see it. And that's a good way to learn. Cool, anything else? All right, I will try to get this video up uh, quickly. I mean, that's probably not super important to the people who are actually here, um, but uh, so that anyone, like I know we have a couple of people who want to join next week, but couldn't make it today. Um, again, I hope we stay around this size because if you get much bigger than this, it becomes more of a lecture and less of a club. And uh, you know, a nice small club like this I highly encourage everyone to just chime in. Um, I think we did a pretty good job of that today, but uh, just talk when you have a question. Don't worry about, um, you know, don't worry about not or interrupting because it's a club. All right. And with that, I will see you all next week. Bye. Thanks, John. Great. Thank, Thank you so John. much. Thank you. Thank you.